ever wonder if Shakespeare, I mean, the bard himself was really, you know, all he was cracked up to be. Hmm. Interesting question. We're diving into this YouTube video and they're claiming that Christopher Marlowe, you know, the come live with me and be my love guy. Right, right. They right. think he actually wrote a bunch of stuff credited to other people, even Shakespeare. Yeah, that's a theory that's been floating around for ages. Mm -hmm. Scholars, conspiracy theorists, they all love it. And this video, it really lays out a compelling case. So they focus on this poet, George Wither. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 They're saying his work is just like littered with echoes of Shakespeare. Like they compare Withers and ABC for Elliman, that was 1585, to Shakespeare's Venus and Adonis, which came out later. Uh -huh. And they both have these strikingly similar descriptions of canker. Mm. So is this significant or just, you know, a coincidence? What do you think? Well, Elizabethan writers definitely drew from like a shared pool of literary devices. Right. right. But the sheer volume of parallels this video is pointing out between Wither and Shakespeare it's, well, it's definitely intriguing. It makes you wonder if it's more than just common phrases. And there's more. The video talks about Withers, like, intense biblical knowledge. The guy even annotated the entire Reims New Testament. They're saying this lines up with all the biblical references you find in Shakespeare's work. Yeah, and they really hammered home that there are over the 1050 identifiable biblical references in Shakespeare. Wow. It suggests there's real depth of understanding, which... You know, if the video is right, both Shakespeare and Marlowe had. It's almost like they're implying Wither and Marlowe were the same person. Right. And it gets even wilder. Hold on to your hats because they're saying Wither and another poet, John Taylor, were like dropping hints in their writing, basically outing Marlowe as their ghostwriter. They called it a 16th century ghostwriting operation. Is that going too far or what? It's a bold claim for sure. Like they analyze Wither's abuses stripped and whipped and they interpret this one passage as like a confession that he wrote, Timon of Athens, which is supposed to be by Shakespeare. Whoa. Now, we can't say for sure, but the whole idea of hidden identities in Elizabethan literature, mm. not totally crazy. Playwrights back then, they used their work to comment on stuff, even poke fun at powerful people all through allegory and, you know, disguised characters. So you're saying there's a chance these poems are like double coded yeah. with secret messages hidden in the text exactly and that's what makes this whole thing so fascinating it makes us rethink who wrote this stuff and why they might have wanted to keep it a secret which leads us to one of the juiciest parts of the video their claim that all those elizabethan poetry collections with female titles like lucretia or delia you know the ones we thought were written by women right they're saying they were actually penned by men specifically Marlowe, and that he used these female personas to get this have a dialogue with his own artistic inspiration Wild. Well, the muse was a pretty standard literary device back then. Poets were always calling on goddesses or some idealized woman for inspiration. Sure, sure. But this video, they're suggesting these female figures were more like projections of the author's own struggles, their creative impulses. So it's like a psychological self-portrait, but through poetry. Yeah. That's deep. But, oh man, get ready, because their next claim... That's where things get real interesting. Here we go. They're saying Marlowe didn't actually die in 1593. They think he faked his death and just kept on writing under different names, including, you guessed it, Shakespeare. Wow. They even break down Withers' later works, and they're interpreting these themes of death and resurrection as, like, clues to support this theory. Interesting. Okay, now we're in full-on conspiracy theory territory. Marlowe as the ultimate ghostwriter, living a double life, churning out masterpiece after masterpiece under all these fake names. But it does make you wonder, why go through all that trouble? I mean, if he faked his death, what was the point of this elaborate charade? Well, the video suggests... It all boils down to the, you know, the, the religious and political climate of Elizabethan England. It was a dangerous time to be, well, let's just say, a free thinker. Right, right. And Marlowe. He was known for his, shall we say, unconventional views. He even got hit with accusations of atheism, which back then, mm -hmm. that was a big deal. Yeah, not exactly something you'd want to advertise. Exactly. So, faking his death. It might have been a way to, you know, escape the consequences of his beliefs, to keep writing without, well, ending up in hot water. So he creates this whole elaborate act to protect himself. But, and maybe I'm missing something here, if he's trying to stay hidden, why use pseudonyms that seem to, like, 
directly point back to him. It seems a bit counterproductive, doesn't it? That's the million-dollar question, isn't it? The video makes the case that these weren't just random names pulled out of a hat. They believe Marlowe chose these specific pseudonyms to send, like, coded messages to people who knew what was up. Okay, so like a secret language for a select few. Exactly. A secret yeah. society of literature lovers. I like it. But what kind of messages was he trying to send? What's hitting within all these layers of, you know, pseudonyms and secret meanings? Well, the video really digs into Withers' work. They say it's full of these little hints about a concealed identity, you know, themes of death and rebirth, even veiled criticisms of the Elizabethan establishment. So he's not just hiding. He's also, like, poking the bear a little. Ballsy move, if you ask me. Yeah. But why take the risk? If secrecy was so important, why risk giving himself away with these clues? It's a fascinating paradox, right? It's like maybe it was Marlowe's way of, I don't know, reconciling his public face with his private beliefs, a way to be true to himself through his writing, even if he couldn't do it openly. Almost like a like a secret rebellion disguised as art. Secret rebellion, huh? I like that. But okay, so we've got Marlowe potentially being with her. But how does John Taylor, our water poet, fit into all of this? Where does he fall in this web of pseudonyms? This is where the video takes another interesting turn. They suggest that John Taylor, yeah, he might be another one of Marlowe's aliases. They point to the fact that both Wither and Taylor published works titled Motto in the same year, 1621. But here's the kicker. Each motto has totally different themes, different subtitles, like they're two sides of the same coin. So it's like Marlowe is having a conversation with himself through these different pseudonyms, presenting two sides of the same idea. Exactly. The video suggests it was his way of exploring an idea from all angles, adding layers of complexity you wouldn't get with just one voice, one identity. Speaking of layers, the video digs into Taylor's motto. There's this passage where he talks about being praised by three figures after reciting Hero and Leander. And of course, Marlowe famously wrote a poem with that title. And that's the connection the video latches on to. They argue this little encounter is a coded message by the three different published versions of Hero and Leander that existed at the time. He had one by Marlowe, obviously, but also contributions from George Chapman and Henry Patel. It's like he's giving shout outs to his collaborators, but in this really subtle, sneaky way. But again, how do we know what's a real clue and what's just, you know, a coincidence? It's a tough call. It really is. And that's what makes these kinds of literary mysteries so captivating, right? Like, yeah. We have to weigh the evidence, think about the historical context, and ultimately come to our own conclusions. There's no right answer, which I think just adds to the fun of it all. For sure. But the video doesn't stop there. Oh, no. They move on to Wither's Fair Virtue, The Mistress of Filaret, written before Shakespeare's first folio hit the scene. Apparently, this work has even more potential clues to unravel. Right. They focus on how Wither uses this unique poetic form, the rhomboid, in Fair Virtue. And they highlight these lines where he describes a character playing with burning coals of flame and questioning if he will ever raise again. They interpret that as a metaphor for Marlowe's own supposed death. Like he's dropping hints, leaving a trail of breadcrumbs about his true identity through these like veiled references. That's a risky game he's playing, if that's what's really going on. Absolutely. And the video runs with that idea, suggesting that Marlowe, maybe because he was afraid of being found or maybe because he couldn't resist, just kept reinventing himself, adopting new identities as easily as, you know, changing clothes. Okay, so we've got Marlowe potentially being Wither, maybe Taylor, and now they're saying there might be even more names in the mix. This is getting hard to keep track of. Right. The video throws out a bunch of other big names from Elizabethan literature as possible. Marlowe Creations. John Davies, Samuel Daniel, Sylvester Jordan, Drayton, Beaumont, Fletcher, Haywood, Broom. They even mention, wait for it, the ever-elusive W.S. himself. Hold on, are they saying Marlowe might have collaborated with himself as Shakespeare? Like, yeah. that's next-level literary mind games. That's exactly what they're suggesting. Yeah. They point to this passage in Wither's 1621 motto, where he says his real name should be obscured with 20 after it. They take that as him admitting to having a whole bunch of pseudonyms. Wow. Okay. So we're talking about a level of literary subterfuge that would make a spy jealous. And if I'm following correctly, we've only just scratched the surface here. This video seems to be overflowing with these potential connections, all these hidden meanings. Yeah. And we haven't even touched on their analysis of Wither's emblem poems and how they connect to Marlowe's own life motto or those suggestive findings in a 1635 collection of Wither's works. Mm -hmm. Trust me, there's a lot more to unpack.
It really does. Every layer we peel back, there's something even more complex underneath it. Like these emblem poems, the video really goes deep on those and it gets fascinating. Okay, so for those of us who aren't exactly experts in, you know, 16th century poetry, what are emblem poems exactly? So picture this, right? You have a symbolic image, an emblem, and then it's paired with this short, often really allegorical verse. Okay. Kind of like a visual riddle, right? Got it. You're supposed to figure out the hidden meaning. They were all the rage back in Elizabethan England. Got it, got it. So like a rebus, but with, you know, more poetry. Okay, so what makes Withers' emblem poems so important to this whole Marlowe theory? Well, the video argues that the imagery and language in Withers' emblems, they often echo themes and phrases we see in Marlowe's work. Mm. For example, they point out that Wither actually uses Marlowe's own life motto, the whole, that which nourishes me, destroys me thing. Far away. Yeah, it pops up in a Latin inscription on one of Withers' emblems, and even within the poem itself. Wow, that's like finding a secret message in plain sight. But hold on, if these emblems are supposed to be like secret clues... Wouldn't that kind of defeat the purpose of using a pseudonym in the first place? Right. It's a good question. Was it a subtle way for him to claim ownership of these works, like a hidden signature? Or maybe it was a calculated risk, a way to see how people would react to his ideas without, you know, putting his name on them directly. It's like walking this fine line between like revealing yourself and hiding yourself at the same time. And the video seems to suggest that this whole pseudonym thing goes even deeper. Are they saying Marlowe had even more identities beyond Wither and Taylor? Oh, absolutely. They even point to this collection of Wither's work that came out in 1635. In the preface, the printer actually says that the author is planning to put out future works under his real name. Wait, so they're saying that Wither, or rather Marlowe, pretending to be Wither, was actually thinking about like unmasking himself, yeah. revealing his true identity. It's not entirely clear if he was going to do a full reveal, mm -hmm. but it definitely adds another layer of intrigue to this whole thing. Especially when you consider the video's analysis of Wither's later works. They think these writings hint at this longing to finally break free from all the secrets, all the hidden identities. Just be himself after all this time. Exactly. So we've covered a lot of ground here. We've got textual analysis, historical context, a whole bunch of potential conspiracies. But at the end of the day, where do we land on all of this? What are we supposed to take away from this whole Marlowe as Shakespeare theory? Well, I think the most important thing to remember is that we're dealing with a lot of speculation here. Don't get me wrong. The video makes a compelling argument. It does. But there's no, like, smoking gun. No definitive proof that any of this is true. So it's still a mystery, still up for debate. Exactly. But isn't that part of what makes literature so great? It makes us think, it sparks our imaginations, and sometimes it forces us to question everything we thought we knew. This whole exploration, whether you believe the Marlowe theory or not, it reminds us that these works, they're still relevant. They're still sparking debate centuries later. There's always something new to discover, always a new way to interpret them. It definitely gives you a new perspective on these classic works. And to everyone listening, we encourage you to check out the works of Marlowe, Shakespeare, Wither, everyone we've talked about today. Read them with a critical eye, keep an open mind, and maybe you'll find your own interpretations, your own connections. You never know, you might even uncover a literary conspiracy of your own.